My name is Dimitris Christopoulos. I am uh, the Vice President of the International Federation for Human Rights and I'm Associate Professor of Political Science at the Pantheon University of uh, Athens. What we learned in my country over the last five years and we're learning in the most dramatic and painful way today is that once you start with downgrading rights, then you have slightly the chance to finish. So it is this negative lesson of the indivisibility of human rights that human rights international teachers like to teach to their students. Indivisib indivisibility of human rights means that this is a, 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 a united corp, a united corpus of uh, rules and norms. And uh, what we know here, what we learned, but one thing is to teach it and another thing is to live with it, is that uh, once you downgrade your life, right to, to health, or to labor, very soon you will come to a situation that you will have to downgrade your right to political participation or your right to, to, to freedom of expression or freedom of association. And this is what happens all along these five years in my country. I have expected from this government to to have a far more uh, progressive human rights agenda than the previous ones, but that has been only relatively the case. I speak to you being a, a, a human rights defender over the last 25 years, and I'm extremely sad to acknowledge that, that in this situation, you cannot expect that during this struggle there is going to be a human rights agenda which will flourish in this country. We do our best, I do my best, my comrades are doing our best, the International Federation for Human Rights is doing its best, the Greek League for Human Rights, everybody is trying, but we all know that we play a game which is hard for us to win. And that is extremely sad to recognize. When we were drafting the report of the International Federation of Human Rights, we saw people of the Troika, we saw people of the task force of the European Commission and so on. And uh, actually, these people, these guys, these technocrats, were not able to understand that we're talking about human rights. These people believe that human rights are only torturing, you know, violations of human rights are only related to, you know, uh, treatments of uh, torture in, uh, by police or by the army and so on. But, you know, we're not in, uh, in the 19th century. The, 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 uh, the, the rights culture, the, the rights normative infrastructure in the European legal civilization has developed. So when we talk about human rights here, we talk about a, a consolidated corpus, corpus of norms, which has to do with a comprehensive set, which starts from the individual rights, such as the right to freedom of speech, freedom of association, and so on. It goes to political participation, which has been violently downgraded in my country because of course these rules these laws could not pass through a, a normal parliamentary procedure and then you go of course to social rights which have been the a priori victims i am afraid that today one of the fundamental repercussions of this crisis management management is the consolidation of the far-right agenda in the Greek politics. Of course, the crisis is not the only one to blame for that. Because, you know, there are countries who have been under severe financial adjustment programs 
comparable to the Greek one, such as Portugal or Ireland, that do not face the development of far right. On the other hand, you have countries such as Austria, Finland, France or England that do not face anything comparable to the Greek situation where you see a development, a drastic development of the far right, which means that the far right is not only the result of the crisis in Europe today. The far right is a part of the European historical identity of the 20th century and the European political culture of modernity. Once we acknowledge that, we will be able to deal with something that we like to treat as an alien, but it is a part of our own political, social, historical and moral legacy. In case the agreement is there, I believe that uh, we do not have a serious hope that anything will change here. So, actually the agreement is the same recipe. The same recipe that in the most drastic way failed in this country. The open question for everybody not only in Greece, but in Europe, is to acknowledge and try to investigate why such bailout agreements failed in Greece and succeeded in the Baltic states or maybe in Ireland. Things in a country develop according to what history teaches or with what history guides and in that sense if only you're able to look with, with what happened back in the in the great history of the 20th century you will be able to understand why the bailout programs failed here of course you can very easily say that the Greeks are lazy the Greeks are uh, you know uh, corrupted and all these easy uh, stereotypical and essentialist uh, uh, arguments but uh, if you want to go further in, I'm sure that uh, you will understand that things are far more complicated from that. So, I am sorry to share with you my pessimism that this bailout program should it be concluded, because yet we are not in a situation that this bailout program is concluded, will lead us in certain, in a few months from now, in the same situation, in the same painful dilemmas, in the same difficult challenges for the whole of the European body politic. Let's forget ideas about a coup. That was not a coup, that was a blackmail, an obviously political, social, financial blackmail of fiscal and financial asphyxization of the Greek banks, which led the Greek government to this decision. Should we agree on that, and we are able to balance the moral and political weight of our normative judgments, I think that both in Greece and everywhere in Europe, we will be able to deliver, to deliver the most prudent judgments about what happened, and maybe be able to deliver the most productive judgments of what is there to come in the future. One of the most, one of the most important intellectuals of the 20th century in Europe, the Italian Antonio Gramsci, said that we need to, to strike the balance between the pessimism of knowledge and the optimism of our will. This is what we're trying to do here. 